Good morning. Can we stand up to our feet to praise our God? glad to be here today. Did you have a great three-day weekend? Well, we are glad that you're back in chapel this morning. We're going to continue to worship in just a minute. Let me bring you up today and on a couple 
opportunities. Spiritual formation workshop today at 2.30 in the prayer chapel. The gathering tomorrow night at 7.30. Life groups all week this week, so please look for the one that's nearest you and participate if you can. Next week's speaker is Brian Kruckenberg from New City Church. Our speaker today is Josh Watt. And for those of you that don't know Josh, Josh graduated from here in 2005. He was a part of the baseball program back then. Went on to be a math teacher, then got involved with ministry and youth ministry. He planted a church in North Phoenix that's doing really well. And we're really excited to have Josh here this morning to speak to us. So Josh, welcome. Give him a hand, would you? He's also got his wife, Aud, uh, Aubrey, here as well, and their little boy, Ozzy. So uh, tell Ozzy hi. <laughs> so we are thrilled that they're here today to share with us in chapel. Psalm 36 says this, Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. Let's sing together.
Let's just continue to worship our faithful God, the God of the ages, the God who was and is and is to come.
this morning that's what we declare great is your faithfulness lord you are so good lord for this morning i can't help but come with a joyful heart a grateful heart to say that i serve a god i worship a god who's faithful who never fails who never forsakes me never leaves me lord i don't know what everybody's coming here dealing with what everybody's walking through but lord i know that the best is yet to come so Lord, I pray on, that we hold on to this hope, that we're held in the palm of your hands. Lord, that your grace is sufficient, your mercy is never ending, your love is steadfast and kind. So Lord, we're believing for greater things and we're praying for greater things. Lord, and we thank you, we worship you and we honor you. And it's in your name we pray, amen. How we doing? What a trip, this is awesome. I went here and it was not like this when I went here back a long, long time ago. Tim already gave a little introduction, but my name's Josh and I'm a local pastor, former youth pastor, former math teacher, and former GCU antelope. I wanna just show a picture of my family just so you see uh, that I have some cred based off how good looking my family is, but that is Aubrey, Elijah, Roman, Jude, and Ozzy, one girl, and lots of boys, and that is the joy of my life to be the dad to those boys and the husband to Aubrey, and a pastor, which I love to do, and I love to teach, and this is probably the biggest setting I've ever taught in, so this is fun. When I came to GCU, if I had to sort of summarize, what am I coming here for? There was three things I wanted out of this place. Baseball success, a wife, and a degree that would shape the rest of my life. And I got none of those. I was on the baseball team. I have one official at bat, wherever the records are kept here, and I grounded out to second base, which is not what you wanna do as a baseball stud. So I have one official at bat, and it's an out. So no baseball success. I left here with no wife or potentials. And I left here with a math degree, which I no longer really use, because I teach the Bible. But I did leave here with one thing, and it's the same thing that a lot of you leave college with. And just as the world sort of explodes and information is everywhere, this starts to happen at a younger and younger age. But here's what I left with. This was the first space where my faith started to be challenged, where people pressed on me, where people gave me stuff that didn't fit with how I thought about life and the world and God and Jesus. See, my story, just quick, so I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I became a Christian at the age of 18 at a Fellowship of Christian Athletes baseball camp. So at 18 years old, I know that the Bible has some great stuff to say. I know that Jesus loves me and saved me. But beyond that, I don't have a lot of stuff in my bucket of faith. And then I come here, and people start to present ideas of God, concepts, things that did not fit with my faith box. We all have this sort of bucket where we put our faith answers and stories and values, values and ideals. And I started to hear stuff that did not fit in my box. More and more, I was given books that made no sense to me with what I knew about Christianity and following Jesus, as little as it was. And that's the reality for everyone in this room. It's not a new reality, but it is sort of taking on a new sort of interest from a lot of people. And there's a word being used quite a bit to talk about what people do when they have a faith box and they start to hear stuff that does not fit in that faith box. And the word is deconstruct or deconstruction. It's sort of a big lofty word. It's not a new word. It applies to literature so that you can deconstruct in literature. 
Your English professors can tell you about that. It's, not, it's been around for a while. There's actually a form of architecture that's a deconstruction architecture. I wanna show you a few buildings. This first one is in Spain. It's a museum. It's a famous architect who's a Canadian guy named Frank Geary. And he's famous for being a deconstruction architect. They call it decon. And it's basically like, what do you know about architecture and space? And what do you know about art? And they started to get jumbled up together. And it's like, what's a window for? What's a door for? And you start to take these things and deconstruct. And they don't fit into previous molds that you might have had about architecture and space and buildings and what they're for. This next one is just an apartment complex. Deconstruction architecture. And this final picture is actually Frank Geary's home in Santa Monica, California. It's a famous piece of architecture. And as you can tell, like, that doesn't line up with what I know about homes and where you're supposed to put a fence. That's odd. He's deconstructed. And it's beautiful and it's great to look at. Here's the issue, though. As we talk about deconstruction as it pertains to faith in Jesus Christ, that's where it gets a little scary. Because Jesus, if it's true, everything he says in the Bible, which I believe it is, he is the most important person in the universe. And what we think about him is the most important thing about us. So we don't want to deconstruct Jesus away. But it's a part of a growing faith. You have a faith box. You have things in that box that make sense to you. More and more stuff is going to be thrown at you, given to you. You're going to go through life experience, pain, and suffering that doesn't fit with what you understand about the world and Jesus. And you're going to have to deconstruct. I just want to give a definition. Here's the definition. Uh, deconstruction. It's taking apart an idea, practice, tradition, or belief, or its system into smaller components in order to examine their foundation, truthfulness, usefulness, and impact. One author said it's like you have this cupboard and everything's in the cupboard and you take everything out of the cupboard and sort of examine it. It's taking apart what you know, examining it, and then deciding does it really go in this box? Should it be thrown out or should it sort of be tweaked? That's deconstruction. And everybody has some level of deconstruction going on. What I want to do today is not bag on it. Like the question people ask, they kind of oversimplify. Is deconstruction right or wrong? Is it good or bad? Is it healthy or unhealthy? Even as I thought about and just prayed about teaching a bunch of college students about this very sort of important topic... Here's how I experience people talking about deconstruction. The first is sort of a label. I talk to a lot of parents, uncles, aunts, and they're worried because their younger siblings or their brother or their sister, someone is deconstructing, and it's sort of a label you push on people who are sort of on the beginning steps of walking away from Jesus is how a lot of people might say it. So it's a label a lot of us maybe have right now based off views we're talking through with our parents and friends and family. The other thing I see, and this is a more with the younger crowd, is sort of it's a badge of honor. Like it's Jesus is here, but the fact that I'm deconstructing becomes the most important thing about me. It's sort of like those in the room that are getting in the Enneagram. Enneagram sort of takes over sometimes. It's like, that's all I talk about, my Enneagram. And Jesus gets pushed down. Deconstruction sort of becomes this badge of honor that becomes the umbrella over everything about me and my faith. But here's the other, just as a pastor, as a former youth pastor, here's the reality. Deconstruction for a lot of you is sort of this open wound. It's something you're currently in as you're trying to make sense of Jesus, faith, life, in a world that is full of pain and hurt and stuff that doesn't mesh with the fact that there's a loving God behind all of this. So I just wanna tell us, deconstruction, Whatever word you want to use for it, let's not talk right or wrong, good, bad. It's inevitable. It's unavoidable. It's a part of life. You're all going to leave here, GCU one day, with a different faith than when you started. I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, that's just how life works. You're going to be different. You're going to be more mature, more wise. I mean, that's why none of you are going back to your old high schools to get wisdom from those kids. Because you're like, I've matured. I've grown, I'm different. And the same will be true when you leave here. But how is deconstruction gonna play into that story for you?
Here's what I want to say today. The Bible gives us sort of two models for deconstruction. If we take this to be the word of God, he actually is very helpful in presenting with us two models of deconstruction. So that's all I want to do. I want to show us the two biblical models of deconstruction. This idea of taking apart your faith, what you believe about the Bible, Jesus, God, sin, heaven, hell, all that. What do you do? As you deconstruct, the Bible shows you one way to do it, and the Bible also gives us another way to do it. So here, if you have your Bibles, I want you to open up to Genesis 3. We're going to be in two passages this morning. But here is the first way to deconstruct. The setting, if you're not familiar, the Bible begins great. First two chapters, amazing. God creates everything beautiful. There's food. There's a garden, there's peace, it's called shalom in uh, the Hebrew word. And then there's this man and woman at the center of the garden, and God says, enjoy it all. Go out, make culture, build homes, have architecture, have kids, enjoy yourselves a ton, except just do me this one favor. The tree over there, I don't want you to eat of it. And what happens? They eat of it. But what led us to that moment, it's in Genesis three here. Genesis three verse one says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? This is Satan's first sermon. And just so you know, he doesn't retweak it. It's the same thing over and over and over. Again, he takes God's word and he leads us to question it. Are questions good? Yes. Socrates says an unexamined life is not worth living. I would tell you if you're not asking big questions, little questions, medium-sized questions, off-the-wall questions, your life is not as good as it could be. Questions are great. Curiosity is key to being human and being human to the fullest. But here's where Satan wants us to land. He wants us to land on questions and questions alone. When Satan thinks about our faith, here's what he wants. If I had to summarize it, he wants a faith that is standing on questions. That's it. Did God really say? He wants us standing on questions without answers. Just sort of a question mark that we're perpetually balancing on. Questions are great, but questions as the foundation of a life, that's all you're standing on, that's dangerous. I had a pastor, mentor, a friend of mine talk about, you know, being a preacher, you get praise, you get to be in front of crowds like this. He's like, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna be praised. People are gonna tell you, great job, a lot. You cannot live and sustain yourself on the praise of men and women. He said, it's a little like cologne. Cologne is meant to be sprayed on you a little bit. You don't drink cologne. He'd say, don't drink in the praise of men and women. And here's what Satan wants us to do. Sort of drink in and be sustained by questions and questions alone. He wants a faith that is standing purely on questions. Did God really say? Jesus is the only way. Did God really say? Sin is real. Did God really say? Talking about sexuality and gender and relationships. Well, God says this. Did God really say? More and more faith just standing on top of questions. And at the center of all those questions is this. Did God really say? For a lot of you in the room, just being around young people for the last decade of my life, a lot of you, it's standing on this question, what God wants you to know is how much you're loved and seen and cared for and adored. There's a Proverbs that says, keep me as the apple of your eye, Lord. If you're in Jesus, you are the apple of God's eye, and yet you stand on this foundation of, did God really say that about you? You? I know what you did. I know who you are. I know what you're like. You think God said that much about you, that much love and adoration and unconditional acceptance is for you? 
did God really say that? One model of deconstruction, Satan wants you to camp out only on questions and doubt. Satan is not creative, one of my mentors says, but he is effective. He doesn't have multiple plans, he's got one, it's you standing on questions. Here's what Satan wants for you in deconstruction, a faith that stands on questions. Well, what's the second way the Bible says? If you have your Bibles or your phone out, go to Matthew chapter five. So that's one model of deconstruction that we see Satan play out in the beginning and it continues to play itself out in a variety of ways. But Jesus now in his first sermon as well, Matthew chapter five, it's a sermon on the mount, very famous sermon. Jesus' first words to his people, the crowds, here's what I'm like, the kingdom's like, here's what you should think about life. And he has this sort of repeating chorus in there that gets at the heart of the second model of deconstruction. Matthew chapter five, verse 21, 22 says this. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment and whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. There's a lot of words in there. I don't wanna unpack them all. But Jesus, here's the repeating theme in his first sermon. You have heard it said. But I say to you, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Quick just observation, who's Jesus talking to? Mostly Jewish brothers and sisters. He's talking to a religious crowd. He's talking to a GC chapter. He's talking to people who have some stuff in their faith bucket. He's talking to people who don't have just starting from scratch. They have some knowledge and some truth and some realities about God that they believe. And he says this, you've heard it said, but I say to you. The Jewish people had the story of God. They had Yahweh, the one true God. And Jesus was the center of this Hebrew story. And these people know the Hebrew story. And he steps in and says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. You have heard it said. Jesus assumes there's a knowledge in the room that is incomplete. You've heard it said. So at our best, and the Jews at their best, here's what Jesus is saying. You have an incomplete knowledge of God. You know this much about God, you need to know this much about. You've heard it said, best we're just short of what we truly should know. At our worst, which is everyone in the room, me included, we have incorrect knowledge of God. We have false things about God that we believe, the Bible, ourselves. And he's like, you've heard it said. You've heard it said. You've heard it said. We all have a bucket of faith right now. And Jesus is telling us, you've heard it said, take it out and examine it. Because I want to dissect and talk about what you believe about life. Notice what Jesus doesn't say immediately after that. You've heard it said, and then just rail on them. You guys are morons. You have missed the point in so many different ways. He says, you have heard it said, but it's like Jesus' gracious way to create space. You've heard it said, but... But Jesus is sort of, he's not anxious, he's not intense, he's not mad. He's like the most calm person in every setting. Hey, you've heard this, but, and he's creating space. And that's what college is. It's like your first like extended amount of space where you're the one in charge to kind of dictate what happens in that space. And Jesus is saying, in this space where you're figuring out what faith is for you and what you really think about the big questions of life, but I want you to have space here. Satan wants you standing on questions. Jesus sort of gently creates space for you to ask questions that truly matter. One of my favorite pastors, authors, says this. You need three ingredients to grow closer to Jesus. He says you need the gospel, good news of what God has done in the person of Jesus. You need the truth, 
But you also need safety. You need a non-judgmental space to actually flesh out all these marvelous truths and all these hard, intense sayings of Jesus. You need the truth, but you also need safe places. And then he says this, you need time because none of us are a finished product right away. Gospel plus safety plus time. Jesus is creating space. You've heard it said, but I say to you, you've heard it said, do life this way, but I say to you, you've heard it said, but I say to you, Satan wants you standing on questions and Jesus graciously wants this for you, space for your questions to be asked. But what's Jesus' end goal? I know Satan's end goal, perpetual, never-ending questions that keep you far from God's presence. What does Jesus want for us? We say, you've heard it said, but I say to you, here's what Jesus wants. He wants his voice to become more important, more loud, more true, more vital to our lives. I say to you. He wants us to know his voice and he wants us to know him more than anything else. He's not creating space so we can kind of just think lofty thoughts about religion and God and the gods and all the big things in life. He's creating space because what's most important is what we think about him and our relationship with him. And he's saying, I say to you, he wants us close to his words and his voice and his life. It's like Jesus wants us closer and closer and closer. Just so you know, the gospel is this. We are as close to Jesus as we'll ever be positionally. If our sins have been forgiven, if we've placed our faith in him, all of our junk is gone. All of it's forgiven. We are secure eternally in him. However, relationally, how that plays itself out day to day is sort of on us as well. Like if Satan has us on questions, we're kind of back on our heels, drifting, falling away from the person of Jesus. But Jesus is saying, hey, Ask questions, Josh. You're not gonna have life figured out 18, 22, 39, but I want you more and more close to me. Like as I think about my GCU days, and I think about, would I go back and do anything different? Well, yeah, I would have been way better at baseball. But as far as deconstruction, the books that I was reading, the people I was letting influence me that were sort of provocative and not fitting with my faith, would I go back and squash all that and say no to big questions and out of the box thinking for me? And honestly, I don't, I think I'd do it all over the same. However, I would do this different. I would spend a lot more time getting to know the voice of Jesus. My time at GCU, I don't know if I picked up the Bible for myself all that often. I kind of lived through the lives of other Christians that had devotional lives that were filling them up, through my baseball friends that had a deeper faith in me. It's not till I moved away to grad school that for the first time in my life, I picked up this Bible and I read it cover to cover. And I had the greatest deconstruction moment in my life. I'm reading there and I read Psalm 16. You are the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And it was like my mind exploded in a Barnes and Noble in Fort Worth, Texas. I had never thought of God being joyful or happy or like the guy I wanna be around. I just knew he had forgiven me as like a judge. He wiped my slate clean. But I had all this baggage from a past life that needed to be deconstructed. And it did not happen till I actually did what Jesus wants us to do. Get closer and closer to his voice. You can spend all the time you want studying everything you want, asking big questions. Don't, don't stop doing that. But if you wanna know the real thing, Open this up, read the gospels, get to know the person of Jesus. I wasted years of my life not going to Jesus personally. I sort of took others at their word. It wasn't until I said, I wanna know him. That's all I want is to know him. He does not change. He was the same for me that he is for you. Hebrews says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You get to know the steady rock of a man. Napoleon, the great world leader, 
says this about Jesus. Je- from first to last, Jesus is the same, always the same. He's majestic and simple. And he's infinitely severe and he's infinitely gentle. Get to know that Jesus. Satan wants you on questions, period. Jesus wants to invite you to ask questions, but he wants to lead you closer and closer and closer to him. We're all gonna deconstruct in some way, shape, or form. The Bible gives us two options. The one who wants us standing on questions or the one who invites questions and invites us into a deeper, deeper relationship. Let me pray for you. Would you bow your heads? Jesus, thank you. How gracious and kind and understanding of where all of us are at. You do not speed up the process for us. You let us walk life at the pace that it takes for us to get it. So for all these young men and women in this room, I pray that you would speak to them directly, the pains and the hurts, the questions, that you would continue to invite them as they live in a world with lots of information that they would know you more than anything. Lord, thanks for this opportunity. Thanks for GCU. It's in your son's name we pray. Everyone said amen. Thank you all.